Welcome to the Healthful Woman Podcast, the fastest growing podcast in women's health. Today's Monday, August 15th, 2022. Hope you're all enjoying your summer. Today and next week, my guest is going to be Jamie, who will tell her story of being diagnosed with breast cancer during her first pregnancy. Today, we're going to be talking about the pregnancy itself. And next week, we will talk about the aftermath. For those of you who are listeners of our High Risk Birth Stories podcast, this was originally a high risk birth story from April 2021. Now, before we start, a few spoiler alerts. First, Jamie is not her real name. She wanted to remain anonymous. Second, both Jamie and her baby are doing great. Third, subsequent to recording this podcast, Jamie had another successful pregnancy, and she is now the mother of two beautiful children. All right. Thanks for listening. Enjoy part one. Have a great week. Welcome to today's episode of Healthful Woman, a podcast designed to explore topics in women's health at all stages of life. I'm your host, Dr. Nathan Fox, an OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist practicing in New York City. At Healthful Woman, I speak with leaders in the field to help you learn more about women's health, pregnancy, and wellness. All right, Jamie, welcome to the High Risk Birth Story Podcast. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. We've known each other a while now. And obviously, I know the story of your birth, and you know the story of your birth, but it's such an amazing in many different ways, the word amazing story. And I, I'm just really appreciative that you were willing to come and talk about it. Thank you. It's cathartic for me. I do believe that. I think for the, the podcast, that's been my experience, that women coming to talk about their own stories is cathartic. Everyone has a story, right? And some of the stories are somewhat straightforward, and some of the stories are very complicated with a good ending, and some are very complicated with a bad ending, unfortunately. But I've just found that women don't have that outlet to tell the story in completion. People just want to know, you had a baby, the baby fine, everything's good, have a good day, and, and that's it. But this is, it's important, and there's so much to learn. I mean, for listening to these stories, they're so unbelievable and so impressive and so impactful. Yeah, I look forward to sharing. So- Jamie, we're talking about the birth of your daughter almost three years ago. We're coming Correct. up on her three-year-old birthday. That's right. Amazing. And Unbelievable. Yeah, and I'm I'm feeling old as all these years <laughs> pass. And you look the same. <laughs> Thank you. Frozen I, in time. That is that <laughs> I my body's not frozen in time. I have I have aged terribly. Just tell us where were you coming into pregnancy? You know, sort of where you were in life and what was going on. So I actually was pretty much a newlywed. I was 33 years old. My husband and I got pregnant very, very quickly. We were very fortunate. And I had a pretty standard normal pregnancy, I would say up until around six months. I was at a regular OB, not a high risk clinic. And they started noticing I was having some issues with my blood pressure riding a little bit high. There was some thought that maybe I did have chronic hypertension, which right. meant I was a person who had blood pressure that ran higher pre-pregnancy, still open for debate. <laughs> there were issues controlling my blood pressure, was running on the higher side. So from like about six to seven, on to my sixth month of pregnancy to the seventh month, we were dealing with trying to manage my blood pressure and control it. And obviously from the OB standpoint, you can probably talk more about it, the concern with the hypertension. Right. The blood pressure is preeclampsia right. or eclampsia, which is a very unhealthy situation for mother and baby. So they were watching me closely. At some point when I got closer to my seventh month of pregnancy, my husband and I both, we felt like maybe we weren't getting as close attention as I could have been getting as far right. as my blood pressure was concerned. I um, had a couple of visits to labor and delivery for high blood pressures. And we felt like maybe after having a consultation with the high risk clinic, that maybe the high risk team might be a better team to manage what I had going on. Right. At the time, and just for disclosure, you and your husband are both physicians. Correct. Did, did Young that, physicians. What, what <laughs> yeah. did you say? Young. Young physicians. Yeah, okay. not like senior, you know. Understood. Um, okay. <laughs> we don't wield a big stick or a lot of power. You you wield a stick that's big <laughs> enough. Did, was that part of it, meaning that you you sort of felt, well, I'm a doctor and I sort of, I, I know about preeclampsia. Was it led by that or just not even related to that? As you'll see the story unfold, uh -huh. I think flipping the switch from being the doctor to uh -huh. being the patient yeah. is a very difficult flip to switch, Yeah, especially in something that's very vulnerable, like pregnancy or cancer, as we'll get to that. Right. And so for me, I think there was a lot of, I wasn't really sitting in the doctor's office as a patient. It's tough. It's you're, you're, you're a patient, you're a colleague. Right. It's you, you, you know more, which is sometimes good, sometimes not good. Sometimes um, not good. Okay. And other than the issues with your blood pressure, 
did you have any specific concerns in, in pregnancy that you entered with? Or was it just sort of you know, like, hey, we're pregnant. This is great. This is exciting. I really didn't have any specific concerns. I, my health in general uh-huh. was okay. Didn't have any history of any major medical issues, um, besides from maybe mild asthma, which wasn't right. active at all during my pregnancy. Right. I didn't have any problem conceiving. Everything had gone well, and we didn't have any major red flags. So we felt confident and happy. We really had no had no idea what was coming down the pipeline. <laughs> and so ultimately, you did transfer your care formally to the hires practice, our practice, Correct. Uh, which is happy to say we're yes, we we then got to the have you. Practice. <laughs> Thank you. Why would you whisper that so <laughs> loud? No, so, like, so so you came aboard. What what was that like? Was it a relief or was it a little scary that like you absolute got it sort of like relief. you got like bumped up to the next absolute level? Absolute relief. Relief. Okay. For me, for me and my husband, it was absolute relief. We had met a lot of the team here already because right. during the course of my issue with my blood pressure, they had been sending me for consultations at, with the high risk doctors. And so we had met a lot of them. And so I felt very confident that I was going to get the absolute best care. So you come over to us. And again, that was, as I recall, sort of the beginning of the third trimester, Correct. you know, six, seven months, 27, yeah. 28 weeks. And you come over to our practice and we're ready to have you and we know you and we're all excited and tell us what happened. So actually it was an interim period between the time that I was being transferred from the previous practice to the high risk clinic. It was about a week and a half. Right where I was just sort of chilling at home. And, you know, I mentioned I have asthma. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of a little bit of like an allergic person. I have also a history of eczema. Throughout my pregnancy, I sort of had like the pregnancy itch. I was getting flare-ups of my eczema. And so my eczema actually was centered around like my torso. So I had very dry skin on my arms, on my chest, on my breast, my whole upper body. And I would scratch, scratch, scratch all night. And in that week period, between the time I was let go by my previous OB team and moved here, My husband was like, this is ridiculous. Your skin looks like crap. You have scabs everywhere. You're itching like crazy. Like, come on, you know better. Like, you know, you need to moisture. Like, do something. Moisture. Put something on your skin. And so I started really making a point of like trying to moisturize after the shower, morning and night. And it was then when I was really taking time with my skin along my breast area that I felt something that was different. And I would literally sit with my husband every night. And I said, feel this, feel this like one spot. You know, it's the two of us sitting on the bed, a tiny spot. I would say less than half an inch by half an inch Mm -hmm. on my left breast on the outer area. You know, I was covered in, you know, eczema, which is basically like a very rough, excoriated rash. Right. We're both sitting there thinking, putting on our, you know, doctor hats. Is this like an inflammatory react? Like what is, it was a small little firm area. Nothing was distinct. It didn't feel like a pea. It didn't feel like a ball. It was just an area of the skin that literally, if you pressed on this table right here, it just felt a little hard. Right. Just felt different. My husband said, oh, it's nothing. Don't worry about it. And every night I would sit and I would touch it every night in that week period. Did he really think it was nothing? Don't worry about it. Or was he saying that just so you wouldn't worry until you saw somebody else? So it was a week period where literally we were convening every evening and touching it. Right. You know, he would say, I think it's nothing but. He said, you know what? We're going to see the new doctors anyway this coming week. I don't remember if it was Monday or whatever. Let's bring it up. And I was a person, like at that point, I was already coming with my lists to Mm -hmm. every appointment of all my questions and especially with a new practice, you know, going over different things, especially I knew my situation already with my high blood pressure that there were going to be some changes probably as to when I would deliver and stuff like that. So I had my list and the last thing I put on my list to discuss was... Oh, mention this, you know, spot on my breast. Last on the list. Last on the list. Yeah. And almost forgotten, by the way. After all of the the critical things like, you know, what, you know, what hair dye can I use? (laughs) And can I, you know, can I, can I have a Diet Coke? All those important things. Yeah, exactly. Those important things. But I mean, (laughs) our first visit was with Dr. Romero, Julie Romero, um, who was great. And she actually ended up delivering me in the end. And, you know, she was telling me about my blood pressure and how... Um, You know, I learned some things there that I may have not been anticipating, that I may not go to full term, that we may consider inducing me early. I still would probably be able to have a natural delivery, but they might not let me go all the way because of the risks of preeclampsia. Right. So I think I was a little bit distracted. And we were all like, done. Thank you so much. Going to get out of our chairs. And the last little thing on my list, I said, oh, wait, 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 Dr. Romero, wait. I said, 
this last thing, I'm so sorry to like take your time. I just have this spot on my breast. I don't know, you know, I just felt it. I have a lot of rashes and eczema. I don't know if you mind checking it out. So of course we'll check it out. My husband and I and her went to the examining room and she examined it. And her and I and my husband all sat there and we all looked at each other and we all said, you know, it's probably nothing, but let's err on the safe side and let's get an ultrasound. So um, for some of the listeners, and maybe you can maybe touch on it more, for different types of breasts and different ages, you different, do different types of imaging. Right. Ultrasound is often like the first stop for younger women. Right. Me personally, I happen to have at that time very large breasts that were also very dense. So yeah. ultrasound was like my first um, stop. Yeah. And also it, people sometimes get concerned about mammograms because of the radiation and pregnancy, oh, right. although you can do them. Uh, clearly you can do yes. them, but some people do that. And also there's certainly more uncomfortable to undergo a mammogram. And often if the ultrasound, you know, someone in, in your age group at the time, if it's, if they find it's a cyst, right, just filled with fluid, no one's going to think it's a concern. Maybe they'll put a needle in it and, right. and sort of aspirate the cyst, but that's ultrasound. That's easy. Right. And so typically people will start with ultrasound, right. but usually we actually leave it to the radiologist. They yeah. frequently, they, they know what they're doing. Did you know Julie before I did this not. pregnancy? No, right. I so, never did met you know her before that meeting? No. So the first time you're meeting, you're doing Correct. everything and yeah. then I met all, a handful yeah. of the doctors right, in the practice before, but not Julie. She said, let's get you scheduled. We'll do it. Of course, we're going to check it out. But it's, you know, yeah. she was very reassuring, which yeah. of course, like who would think? Like why? I have yeah. no family history of breast cancer. I have no family history of ovarian cancer or anything that could even yeah. raise an alarm that somebody my age should have such a problem. And so, all right. Something in me was weighing very heavy on me. I had a little bit of trouble getting an appointment. I had about two weeks till the ultrasound appointment, and I was extremely anxious. Obviously, yeah. I was pregnant, you know, all of those things. Did you feel the mass changing no, over those two weeks? I did not. Right. No. That and would have been even more scary, obviously. Yeah. No, yeah. I didn't. And the truth of the matter is, is that when you talk to other people and in retrospect, these things don't grow quickly. Right. It's not something that appeared overnight. And so in the two weeks, is kind of like a drop in the bucket, really, in the scheme Medically, but not emotionally. Not emotionally, right, for right. sure, but medically. Yeah. Um, so no, I don't feel any kind of way about it, except right. it was just the anxiety inducing, sure. inducing. So I was calling every day to see if they had a cancellation, and they didn't. And then we showed up on the day for the appointment, and you go in, and it's a very small room. And this is pre-COVID. Yeah. <laughs> but you actually can't take your spouse in the room because the room is very small. So they have the spouse wait outside. You know, it's not only a cancer imaging place. It's for all kinds of things. Sure. Um, so they don't automatically assume that you're going to need right. some type of support. And didn't the the doctor who's supposed to see, did that person book yes. out? Yeah. So I actually, <laughs> I had Google image the doctor who was supposed to be doing my ultrasound. I don't even remember his name to right. this day. But as my husband and I were sitting in the waiting room, we saw him getting his bag and his umbrella <laughs> and going to the elevator. <laughs> And I said to my husband, what is going on here? I said, I need this done today. I don't care what happens. I will drag him out of his car. Like, he needs to come do this today. So ultimately, when they called me and they said he had a medical uh, family emergency, and I had a different doctor. It's actually first the tech does the ultrasound, right. and then they call the doctor in. I have a medical background. I'm watching the screen as they're doing the ultrasound. I could immediately see that there was an irregularity there. I'm not a radiologist, right. but... For my untrained eye, mm -hmm. semi-trained eye, I could see that there was a different in the... Right. And you could see they're taking 46 pictures right. of, of you know. one centimeter space versus right. two pictures so of everything here else. here I am. Like, yeah. I'm alone. I'm pregnant. I'm basically over seven months pregnant at this point, sitting on this bed alone in this tiny room with this tech. And she's, I'm going to get the doctor. Right. It's like, okay. Because so. the text, they can't tell you what right. they think. Because you, know? you, you don't want them to say anything wrong yeah. in either direction. I don't blame them. Yeah, you don't want them me. to say it's fine when it's I not don't. or say it's not fine when it yeah. is because that's that's a disaster. We have the I same issue with, with pregnancy, yeah. with babies. It's just, it's feel, a disaster. I yeah. feel bad for them. It's very hard yeah. for them. It's very hard. Yeah. So the doctor came in, lovely lady. She actually got my husband. So he came into the room. We're all like huddled in mm. this tiny room. Yeah. Four of us, yeah. me, the tech, my husband and the doctor. And she said, you know, it really looks suspicious. It doesn't look good. I said, you think it's cancer? And she said, I can't say for sure, but it looks very suspicious for cancer. And I just sat on that bed and I just was bawling. I was crying. I said, so like, what do I do? I don't even know where to start. What do I do? She goes, well, you need to get a biopsy done. We can't get you in here. This was a Friday. We can't get you in until Monday. And I just begged her. I said, please, I'm begging you. I'm begging right. you. Please do it today. Right. Please, please, please. I'm begging her, you know, not knowing what she could do. And she walked out and she came in and she sort of gave me a smile and like a wink. And she said, oh, you know, we just had a cancellation. Right. I'm going to do it for you right now. 
a lot of humanity. Yeah, it's, it, it's yeah. a lot. It was she, a lot. Yeah, and she she did what she could yeah, under the circumstances, and that's it's, yeah. those three days. It's a big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. By having the biopsy done on Friday, I was actually able to get the results on Monday. Who called you with the results? So actually, um, she had told me to anticipate a phone call from her, but it was getting close to four o'clock on Monday, and I hadn't heard. So my husband and I, you know. It's just me and him. We haven't had the baby yet. So right. we're pregnant. We're sitting, we're looking at each other going, is this a good sign or a bad sign? That like oh, yeah. if she hasn't called, does this mean everything's good? Or, you know. So it was four o'clock and, you know, imagining that the clinic closes at five or five thirty, I decided just to call. Um, so I actually called her and she's like, Oh, I was meaning to call you. Do you have a minute to talk? I said, Of course. <laughs> you bet I do. I just yeah. called you. <laughs> you know, and um, she said it was positive for cancer. You can't necessarily say the stage at that time, but you can say what the pathology is. Right, so right. meaning early stage could be like DCIS. Right, um, right. And then invasive, which is right. more of the cancer side is right. invasive ductal carcinoma. Right. So um, that's what I had. Right. Because the stage is more how far it's spread. Right. And you can't know that from a biopsy. Right. The biopsy tells you like the cancer we're looking at how gruesome is it? Sort right. of, you know, there's different levels of right. how bad of a cancer. So the biopsy can tell you basically the grade. Yeah. The grade. <laughs> yeah. It can tell you the hormone status. Right. Or her two status. Right. But it can't tell you anything about your lymph nodes. It can't tell you anything about um, right. distant issues in your body, God forbid. Um, so, you know, she said this is, you know, the diagnosis and I'm really sorry. Um, and as soon as possible. I said, well, who's my first stop? Who do I see? Like, am I right. talking to an oncologist? Am I talking to a surgeon? Like, who? You know, your first stop is a breast surgeon. That's your first stop. So she gave me some names. So we got off the phone. In all honesty, my husband and I, we sat there and we cried. Yeah. Um, yeah. For a very decent period of time. And actually, now that I'm remembering the doctor who did my biopsy, she actually reached out to one of to a couple of the surgeons. Um, so she actually took that job off my plate so that I could really have some time to absorb. Right, right. So she's told me to hang tight for her email to see who was going to be able to see me the soonest. Right. Over the weekend between the biopsy and the results, were you assuming it was going to be cancer or were you assuming not? Or were you already reading up on it and trying to learn about it? Were you like, I'm just going to mark it out and felt, find out? I definitely felt a pit in my stomach that something was wrong. I felt that. Right. I, I felt that my intuition and I don't yeah. know, I just felt that something was off. So that's how I got my diagnosis. So we sat and we, we, you know, we really cried for, you know, there's all, you get all the feelings. Right. Why is this happening to us? Um, what did, what did we do wrong? You know, it doesn't make sense. Could there be a mistake? And then, you know, obviously calling my parents and telling them, which was a whole other level of your poor parents. I mean, it was just, it was devastating. I can't imagine. It was devastating. I, I mean, like, listen, I can't imagine yeah. happening it to, to yourself, but also happening to your child. It and was absolutely yeah. devastating. I mean, I got the diagnosis on Monday. My mom was already, my parents live out, they don't mm -hmm. live in New York. Right. Um, my mom was already with me by Wednesday for my appointment with the breast surgeon. Um, it was very difficult. I would say I didn't sleep. I wasn't eating. Just a lot of fear. A lot sure. of fear of the unknown. Right. I didn't know what this meant for me. Was I going to survive? Was my baby going to survive? Right. Did you have a sense at all of what it meant in terms of pregnancy? I mean, obviously you had an idea conceptually, right? Just as doctors, I, I breast cancer, it's probably surgery and maybe chemo, maybe radiation, depends, you know, sort of you understand the brackets of what's going on here. But pregnancy is like a whole, you know, vacuum to right. most to most doctors. Like, what the hell happens in pregnancy? Right. So, did that even enter your mind at first, or was it? It did enter all my mind. It did yeah. enter my mind, and um, you know, I'm very much the type of person that if somebody gives me a problem or a diagnosis, not only for myself, even for in my practice with my own patients, like I'm very much about reading and learning and going into as much detail as I can mm -hmm. to, you know, try and understand. And I felt like for my own situation, the only way to really not get out of it necessarily, but the best way to handle it was to educate myself the most. And so in that brief period of time before I saw the breast surgeon, I already understood that, you know, in breast cancer, if you're diagnosed while pregnant, there's like three stations of, and those three stations, first, second, and third trimester that really determine what your treatment is going to look like. And so because I was on that cusp between second and third I had a feeling that there was a chance that I might get chemo while I'm pregnant. That fact, by the time I went to my appointment, I sort of was right. thinking- It was on like, the table. I was thinking, is that is that what's happening? Not like, am I getting chemo, but like, am I going to have chemo while I'm pregnant? 
And what's that? What is that going to do to my baby? Yeah. Scary stuff. It is scary stuff. And again, when someone's reaching towards the end of pregnancy, you're sort of making the decision. Is it better to wait, deliver the baby and do everything afterwards? Or is it better to start beforehand? And if you start beforehand, are you just doing surgery when you're pregnant? Are you doing surgery plus chemo when you're pregnant? And, and sort of figuring that out. And it, there's no one answer, obviously, there because it depends on exactly how far pregnant, what's with your pregnancy, what's with the baby, what's with the cancer, you know, who's the, all these things that have to be uh, discussed. And I know that there was a lot of talk about that. That's after you met with the surgeon. Yes. So you met with the surgeon, I guess, was it a few days later on Wednesday? Said, yes. Right? So diagnosed on Monday, met with the breast surgeon on Wednesday. I'm going to ask you how that went, even though I know how it went. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how'd, um, that, how'd that go? Yeah. So pre-COVID, right? I could yeah. bring my family with me. Yeah. Um, which, you know, of all things that I'm grateful for that it didn't happen to me during COVID. Yeah. Um, because I cannot imagine going through any of this and being alone um, in talking about these things. But there I was, I was seven months pregnant and changed sitting in a breast surgeon cancer clinic with my new husband and my mother who right. lives out of state. I'm like, what is going, what is happening? Right. Here? And you're, and you're just, just to set the stage, you're at seeing someone who's at a major academic yes. medical center who sees breast cancer all the time, sees yes. pregnant women with breast cancer. This is not some sort of random right. clinic that's never seen this before. Right. hundred percent. You're in the best will, of the best. I'll, yeah. I will, the best of the best for yeah. sure. But yeah. I will probably maybe um, correct one thing that you said, not yeah. necessarily correct it, but modify yeah. it. You know, I'm not sure that all breast surgeons are comfortable taking care of pregnant women with breast cancer. I didn't say comfortable. Yeah. I said they've done and it. And I don't know. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I, I know yeah. it's not uncommon. Yeah. I know it's not uncommon, but I feel like um, it's not their bread and butter. It's not what they're yeah. dealing with all the time. Well, most doctors have a phobia of pregnant women. 100%. They are terrified of pregnant women and they don't want anything to do with them because it's just- 100%. Yeah, but, but there is definitely experience there yes, in pregnant women. for sure. So. <laughs> yeah. Before I even met with the doctor, uh -huh. I had a mammogram done, which they reassured me would right. be fine um, while pregnant. So that was actually the first good bit of information that I got after I had them, you know, they covered my stomach to make sure, you yep. know, to make sure that the baby would be fine with the radiation, that my cancer was only in one spot. I didn't have satellite lesions. I didn't have any other lesions in the other breast, any other lesions in the same breast. It was one spot. Which for me, that was, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm looking for, you know, any, I'll take any, uh, I'll take any silver lining I can get. Under the circumstances, yeah. that's best case scenario. Yeah. Right. So meaning it wasn't like, ex, you know, there are yeah. different types of lesions that are sure. extending out. There was no chest wall involved, you know, all the kind of yeah. stuff. Um, thank God. So met with the breast surgeon and she said, look, I'm just going to give it to you straight. How this is going to be. You have cancer, but you'll most likely survive. Like you will most likely survive this, which I was like. That's like great, great news, right? And then right after she told me that, she said, but there's just something you need to know that you'll never carry, you'll never be able to carry another baby again. And I was just like tunnel vision. Like we all just sat there dumbfounded. And I was like, what? Like, what do you mean? Why? Here I'm, Right. you just told me I'm going to survive. I'm going to thrive. I'm going to do great. Right. Why shouldn't, right. why shouldn't I be able to get on with my life? after this. Right. You're not taking out my uterus, are you? Right. Yeah. <laughs> she said, well, you know, your cancer is hormone positive. My cancer was ER positive, right. PR, which is estrogen and progesterone positive, HER2 negative for people that mm. are interested, which means that my cancer, the gas that was fueling my cancer was the female hormones right. like estrogen and progesterone. Which is probably why it popped up when you were pregnant. Right. But it didn't appear meaning right it these grew things, because it grew pregnant. because i was pregnant right it yeah, yeah it wasn't created because of pregnancy exactly there's actually a lot of debate about whether as a side note whether pregnancy increases the risk of breast cancer oh, i have overall. a lot to say yeah. on that Dr. and Fox. and most of the data is that it, it doesn't it, it does not it, it actually fact, yeah it, it probably it, saves lives by showing the cancers right. that are that are otherwise sort of hanging out and hiding yeah. you get pregnant they grow but then you can take them out that's right and then you know i have actually have a lot to say on that also because i've learned a lot yeah. since this whole experience i would say that we were floored yeah and she kept the doctor kept talking but i was still on this yeah you know i wasn't thinking about cancer anymore the dreams of like the family that i wanted to have and the life i wanted to build i felt like it was all gone like in an instant and it's so not interesting. Because of yeah. cancer. Not because not because I may not survive cancer. It's because right. it's like, well, I'm gonna survive, but now I can't have kids anymore. Right. Like, right. She was trying to talk to me, and we're gonna do this. We're gonna, and I, I'm like, I'm. Can we go back to that? 
she's like, why do you want to keep talking about this? Like, <laughs> why do this you is what it is. This yeah. is how it's going to be. If we, if you can, you know, maybe one day somebody else will be, you know, hopefully you can freeze your embryos, maybe mm-hmm. if we have time and somebody else can carry a baby for you one day. Nothing against that. I, I yeah. don't have any feelings on surrogacy, not pro or against mm-hmm. whatever. It's just not something that I ever thought about for me. And I was just floored. I just, I couldn't wrap my brain around it. Did you have a feeling at the time that that may not be correct? Meaning that she, that you're like, wait, I, that, were you that, skeptical or I, just shocked? I think I was mostly shocked. And I would say that going back to what we were talking about, flipping the switch between right. being a provider and being a patient, my brain and my heart were fighting because I didn't know how much to challenge the doctor on it. Since then, I've learned a lot. Mm-hmm. And if you want an opinion about something, go to that specialist. Right. So a breast surgeon might not be the best person to talk to about risks related to fertility. There are other specialists for that, like oncologists and fertility specialists that right. can give you your, a better risk assessment um, about what those challenges uh, might look like for you. But at the time, my life was over, not because of the cancer. I felt like all my, you know, I we mentioned that I have a medical background. Right. I've spent majority of my adult life not focusing on my personal life, focusing on school sure. and training, self-advancement. And I had felt like now's my time. Right. Like here I am. Like now's my time. I'm gonna like pop out like three kids back to back. You know, we had a plan, and it was all gone. Like in an instant, from like one sentence that somebody said, it's, it was crushing. It was soul crushing. Yeah. Absolutely soul crushing. It's so crazy. Also, I mean, listen. I think back. I know that between that day and the next couple of weeks, we spoke several times at length. Right yes. about about because of this, you know, we spoke. You spoke with one of my colleagues. There's a lot to discuss, obviously, but I don't recall that that was even part of our discussion. I don't remember, like when you told me that today, that you were told that you wouldn't be able to have kids. I don't recall that I ever knew that someone told you that. No, I even. don't think you did. Yeah. I mean, because we were talking about, okay, you know, you have cancer. Like, what's the plan? Are we going to, you know, she can do so, surgery first, this, and, yeah. and that was the big discussion and, yeah. you know, talking about what, so, what you know, to do I with the pregnancy. So, you I don't know how much Julie remembers uh-huh. Dr. Romero, which I don't know how much you want to build up to my delivery. Okay. Ultimately, when I came to deliver, which we can get to, right. you know, the circumstances of that, I just was begging her to make it go my way. And I said, you, you know that I, this might be my last shot. Right. Like, I'm not going to get to do this again. Like, please don't make me, don't right. make me have a C-section. Right. <laughs> like, please, please. And I was begging her, like, not a normal person. Right. Like, right. Um, so we can get get to that. <laughs> right. You know, I think I felt like also I didn't want anybody else to tell me no at that point. Like meaning that doctor had told me that, but I don't think I was at a stage to discuss it with so many providers to be like, yeah, that's true. Like, yeah, you're screwed. <laughs> like, yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So who you you met with the breast surgeon, you met with us, you also met with an oncologist. So um, I actually did not meet with an oncologist early on. I actually, um, after I met with the breast surgeon, your team actually, I don't think was involved in the conversation just yet. Um, I actually went for a couple of other consultations to different academic um, facilities. Right, that I remember, definitely. To get different opinions. And what the doctor init- at my initial consultation had said was, um, the baby needs to come out. We need to get your cancer out, but the baby needs to come out first. I said, but I don't understand. Like I'm seven and a half months pregnant, but we have to get the cancer out. You know, it didn't even occur to me at that time to um, to say, like, why can't the two things go together? Why can't I stay pregnant and you take the cancer out? She was talking about, you know, needing to be induced so that I could go on to have this lumpectomy. So a lumpectomy is where you take out, you know, just a portion whatever portion of the breast has the cancer plus the borders that are hopefully clear, not a mastectomy, which is the whole breast. Now I know a lumpectomy is like not a major surgery. Like women that are pregnant even have appendectomies, yeah. which are much more invasive. Right. And so that's what prompted me to get a couple of other opinions. And in that time is when you and I and the yeah. team here really started putting our heads together to figure out what's going on and what we're going to do. It's not something that any one specialist can come up with the plan because it's it's something where the, you know, the what we do, the MFM doctors, we have to talk to the surgeon and we have to talk to maybe the oncologist. And again, it's sort of based on this cancer, can you operate? How, you know, how extensive is going to be? How long is it going to take? What's going to happen? What's the blood loss going to be? 
when do you have to do chemo? Which chemo do you have to give? How soon? You know, what if it's delayed two weeks, four weeks, six weeks? And everyone's got to sort of figure it out and come up for the, the right plan for the right person. And also there's decisions to be made that are where there isn't a right or wrong answer. And it's it, it comes on to you, like which direction do you want to go? And that's that's hard, obviously, but it takes a lot of conversations and it really has to be a team approach. And it's... Uh, it's hard. This is hard stuff, obviously. I would say obviously. that at that moment in time, I don't feel, I, I don't recall um, a sense of like, what do I want? Right. Um, which was a very difficult thing for me. A, being, having type A personality, sure. medical background of like always being in control. And, you know, um, I would say that the provider, the breast surgeon was reluctant to operate on me while pregnant. Right. Um, but we twisted her arm. Yes, he did. <laughs> um, I, remember, I remember speaking to her. It was a very tumultuous Say, no, no, weeks. you could do it. It's fine. Yeah. Don't worry. We'll monitor the baby. That's right. It's all good. That's right. <laughs> and when that plan was solidified, I took such a huge sigh of relief because I'll never forget right. Dr. Fox <laughs> saying to me, we don't need a sick mom and a sick baby. Right. And when you said that to me, something just clicked and I was like. This is the plan, like yeah. because whatever is going to happen with me is going to happen with me. But right. for something so small like a lumpectomy, there's right. no reason why she can't get her shot. Um, you know, to go at least to somewhat full term, and right? Have less complications later. Usually, the surgeons they don't even realize it's an option. Yeah, they're like, they're like how like, and we say, listen, you're not operating anywhere near baby. Like so, unless like there's the craziest complication in the history of lumpectomies. Nothing's going to happen to anybody and we'll monitor the baby just in case. And, you know, if you induce the labor and deliver the baby, you're talking about a baby that's going to nick you for a month and probably will be okay, but there's a lot of stuff. And then you're, then you have cancer and you're recovering from it. And now you have a baby in the NICU. And also from a mental health perspective, it's, it's, it's tough. And so I think the plan we ultimately had, which of course got blown up, but right. <laughs> the plan is that it was, it was, you were, we were going to do the surgery at like, 32, 34 Correct. weeks. And then after the surgery was done, we were going to deliver the baby so that you could get your eggs frozen so right. that you could then have chemo. After the <laughs> right. surgery, you were going to let me carry to yeah. uh, 36. You right, know, 36. Because you, yeah, you have to recover weeks. anyways before right. you get the chemo. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so at right. that time, actually, they didn't know if I was going to get chemo or not. That's the interesting mm. thing. That was actually determined later by something called an oncotype test. Right. Right. And that plan would have allowed you to get the lumpectomy sooner right. and deliver a little bit later. Correct. And were you to need chemo, you would have had the time also to do some fertility. Right. Store some and eggs. Because I'd be could, pregnant yeah. when I got my chemo. Correct. Not yeah, that it's yeah. unsafe. I just want right. to say that you I'm can. there are yes. many women who get chemo while yeah. they're pregnant, especially in the second trimester. Yeah. And the side effects right. are little right. to none. It's it's okay in the third trimester too. People think it's much more dangerous to the baby than it actually is. The reason you don't normally do in the third trimester is by that point, you usually can just wait till after right. delivery. Right. But it is doable. Yes. Right? So, okay. So that was the plan. And so we, that were, was the we plan. were ready. And I felt like, man, I had this rock star team. I had like the best breast surgeon mm -hmm. in Manhattan and I had the best maternal fetal, you know, the best high risk pregnancy doctors. And we just felt so relieved and confident. But, you know, I had a lot going on internally mm. and emotionally. Um, and going back to my blood pressure, you know, it was being affected by all of this stress. And I would say that to say that I was in my right mind at that time is probably an absolute lie. Sitting before you today is like a normal composed person. Mm -hmm. But I would say that um, I definitely was going through an emotional breakdown for sure. Just the reality of it all that I wasn't going to be able to have more kids or carry right. a child. I mean, that really, I didn't think the cancer was going to kill me. Right. I just thought my life was over from, meaning from my my hopes and dreams for my right. family with my husband. Right. And I was a mess. Right. I just, I was a mess. Um, as an outsider, you you did look like a mess in terms of, yeah. this, but, but sort of as expected. Right. I mean, I, none of us were saying, you know, oh my God, she's like, it she's losing it. To no, it was, it was, like, it was like, we're like, this is really hard. Right. She's trying to, juggle all these things yeah. and deal with all these things. I definitely think but, I did yeah. the best I could. No, honestly, you did great. You did what I had. You, you did as well as anyone could do yeah. under those but circumstances. But I was not in my, I can so tell trying. you 100% yeah. looking back now, 100%, I can tell you that I was in a completely like dissociative state to the point where, and this is where the plan got blown up, yeah. is that um, I basically came into the clinic oh. for my pre-op appointment for my this lumpectomy while pregnant that everybody's you know the gold star team is on board to help me 
And my blood pressure was like, whew, and new plan. Said, yeah. <laughs> and they said, um, all right, well, you have to go to the hospital now. Looking back now, the, in the time between that the plan was put in place and the time that I came in, I was not well, meaning like I wasn't feeling well. I could say looking back that I definitely was ignoring signs of being sick for sure. But my mind was so wholly focused on getting to the lumpectomy and carrying my baby to full term. Right. To the point where that sounds crazy. Like I'm a physician. Yeah. I, how can you say, how are you ignoring signs that you are like medically ill to the diagnosis of preeclampsia, which is, it doesn't, there's no logical sense behind it because preeclampsia can be, can be life-threatening for the mother and for the baby. Right. So there's no logic behind it. But all I can say is that I was not. I was not in, I was in a fight or flight mode for sure, evident by my blood pressure. <laughs> I just felt completely defeated when I was admitted to the hospital to have the baby. Right, right. So that was the plan. We said, you, like, this is, A, it's not safe to have surgery when you're like this. Right. B, it's not safe for you in general. C, it's not safe for the baby. So it, it, when it's that bad at 34 places, we would have done that anyways. Yeah. You know, cancer, no cancer. Right. At that point, we're like, all right, it's time to deliver. It's safer for you, safer for the baby. I said, okay, you'll deliver. And then you'll have the lumpectomy. Right. Like, we'll sort of just change right. the order of things. Did you sort of feel like, well, at least this was taken out of my hands in a sense that I didn't choose when to deliver the baby, when to do this? This is just sort of dictated? Or was it, did you feel like no control was taken away from me? It's a very complicated question. And I'll say that this some is, of- This is a tough podcast. Yeah, we, really get, of, we really get into it. Some of what you said right now, I did feel, but not in relation to the delivery. So mm. for example, ultimately when I needed chemo in between the time that I had the baby and the time- and then I had the lumpectomy. Mm -hmm. They take out the tissue. They send it for a special test called Oncotype, mm -hmm. which basically determines whether you're going to have chemo. If it, the if the result, the number is low, you don't need chemo. If it's high, you for sure need chemo. If it's moderate in the middle, it's like a discussion between your doctor and you decide. And um, I was so anxious, so anxious that I didn't want chemo. I was so, so, so anxious. And then when I got the result that my score was high and I needed chemo, the wave of relief that I felt because I felt like, number one, the decision was taken from me. Like, right. this is the number in black and white. Like, right. you need chemo. Number two, I felt like, let's just throw everything at it. Like, yeah. we are just going to throw everything at it. Like, right. chemo, whatever, whatever, we are going to do it. So in that regard. But as far as the delivery goes, I would say probably not. I didn't mm -hmm. feel that way at the time. Looking back, I think everybody helped me to the greatest extent that they could. You know, I was admitted and um, nobody told me you are 100% needing a C-section. No, not one of the doctors said that to me, which I was so appreciative of because the only thing I could think is this is my only chance. Right. This is it for me. Right. Like, however this goes right now, what, however you feel, like if, if you have a once in a lifetime chance to experience something, you might want to grab onto it and take it, right? So, you know, it was very emotional, but I would say that they gave me the steroids to help the baby's lungs develop. So I was given like a 48 hour kind of chill out period <laughs> with the wonderful magnesium on board. <laughs> so the magnesium is an IV medication they yeah. give to bring down your blood yeah. pressure. And if you weren't loopy enough, that really- I was like <laughs> drunk and high at the same time. That is, that <laughs> My is, My mother was yeah. like, has she had a stroke? Like, what are you saying? No, like that. You know, two days of just chilling out. And then I was very appreciative. The team gave me a chance to try and have a natural delivery to get induced. And I felt like it was the best case scenario that at least I could try to have somewhat, you know, people talk about these birth plans that they have. You know, I never really had a birth plan, but right. I, just, I didn't think you would ever go this way. Right. You know, this is like the worst um, <laughs> outcome possible. Right. Very few people have in their birth plan. All right, then I'll have the lump back to me. Right, exactly. Then, yeah. <laughs> but ultimately, you know, after I got the steroids for two days, they decided, you know, we'll give you a chance to have the baby naturally. And they tried to induce me. But unfortunately, after like 24 hours, I wasn't progressing. The wonderful Dr. Romero came to tell me that, um, you know, this is not like going the way we want and we're going to have to go to C-section. Bad news, Julie. Right. <laughs> and, you know, I just I'll never forget, like, I, I honestly, like, I feel sorry for what I did to Julie <laughs> because I literally just sat there and cried. I just cried and I begged her. I said, please, please, please don't just like give me another hour. Give me another two hours. You know, like, what could she say? What could right. she do? Like, it right. just is, you know, I'm not trying to get emotional here. But I was just begging her, begging, begging, begging. Please don't, don't, don't take me. Don't, right. you know. The whisperer had to come in. Dr. Fox <laughs> had to come and walk me off the ledge to tell me, like, it's okay. Like, we did the best we could. This is how it's going to be. 
So ultimately, I had a C-section. Was I that matter of fact and cold about it? No, <laughs> no, you were great. This is how it's going to be. No, but in a very <laughs> loving and caring way. And to be honest with you, in this whole process, I think I became very jaded as far as providers go just from some of you know, yeah. words matter. Words yeah. are very powerful, oh, especially when you're in a very vulnerable situation. And it's very important to find doctors that you can connect to. And so choose, choose your words wisely. Choose your words wisely. Yeah. So no, you were very, very kind. Oh, thank and you, um, yeah. you were able to convince me to go to C-section. <laughs> you know, nobody you can't take somebody kicking and screaming. Right. Who's out of their mind right. to C-section. Right. It's, cer- it's certainly not ideal and potentially illegal. Yeah. Right. <laughs> So, you know, ultimately I reneged, I agreed. Yeah, but it was the right thing. I mean, 100%. ultimately, what are you going to do? You 100% know? it yeah. was the right thing. Yeah. I mean, my daughter, who was estimated weight to be five pounds, four ounces, came out three pounds, 14 ounces. Yeah, you had, that was one, not a good she placenta. She was tiny, <laughs> no. And I just remember I was so drugged and I looked, they, you know, the resident brought right. the baby over me and she's uh-huh. like, here's your daughter. And I just, I was so drugged. Right. And I just looked up at her and, you know, I'm going into my training and I said to my husband, I said, she's, she's so small. Mm-hmm. She's too small. Mm-hmm. She's too small. So, you know, that was scary. But you know what? She was breathing on her own, doing everything on her own. She was just a tiny little thing. Ultimately, she did great. She did great in the NICU. Yeah. How long was she in the NICU? Less than 10 days for sure. She That's a short amount of time. Yeah, she was just there weeks. for yeah. feeding and growing. Yeah. That's it. She yeah. literally, thank God, didn't yeah. have any other complications. Yeah, they're like the superstars of the NICU. If there's one place that's going to like reel you back into reality, like yeah. if you think your stuff is bad, right? go to the NICU. Yeah. Pre-COVID, you know, you meet other people at the NICU, other families. And by that point, my both of my parents were already with me. And so we were all, you know, sitting in the waiting room together. There's another family who has a baby who's been waiting for a new, waiting for a heart transplant for how long? Yeah. You know, it's just that old story. If you could throw your problems, you know, yeah. in a bucket, you know, right. um, heartbreaking. So Nick, you a lot of good lessons there. But uh, my daughter did great. Yeah. And they're amazing. They're, they're amazing. just, they're just unbelievable. I mean, it's an unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's unbelievable. So my daughter did great. For me, I would say that my preeclampsia sort of like extended to postpartum there yeah was like some problems there with my blood pressure um so i had an extended stay okay at the hospital <laughs> you know i've had a journey since then i hope you enjoyed hearing the first part of jamie's story over the years i've unfortunately had several patients diagnosed with breast cancer during pregnancy and as you can imagine it's always a very difficult situation however fortunately the prognosis for the cancer is essentially the same as it would be for a non-pregnant woman, so if it's caught in an early stage, the chance for a cure is very high. Also, it usually has less of an impact on the baby than most people think. Thank you for listening to the Healthful Woman Podcast. To learn more about our podcast, please visit our website at www.healthfulwoman.com. That's H-E-A-L-T-H-F-U-L-W-O-M-A-N.com. If you have any questions about this podcast or any other topic you would like us to address, please feel free to email us at hw at healthfulwoman.com. Have a great day. The information discussed in Healthful Woman is intended for educational uses only. It does not replace medical care from your physician. Healthful Woman is meant to expand your knowledge of women's health and does not replace ongoing care from your regular physician or gynecologist. We encourage you to speak with your doctor about specific diagnoses and treatment options for an effective treatment plan. Paid sponsors of the podcast are not involved in the creation of the podcast or any of the content. Support for our sponsors should not be interpreted as medical advice from the podcast, the host, or the guests.